since I preached my last sermon, which was titled Subordinate But Equal, I've had three people come up to me and say, Pastor, I didn't agree with what you said. And uh, at least two of these people were quite adamant, and of course they were all women. <laughs> we don't like this idea of the wife being subject to the husband, basically was the idea. Jane Johnson was not one of that, those women, by the way. <laughs> but after my sermon, she came and gave me a little blurb from the newspaper where some theologian was trying to explain that the word submit in the Bible does not really mean submit. It means simply something radically different. I'm going to make some remarks about that a little bit later on in our study this morning. Another person came to me, this is one of the three, and said, Pastor, you read from the writings of the Apostle Paul. What can Paul teach us? Paul wasn't even married. Well, let me just mention that we are not absolutely certain if the Apostle Paul was married or not. But it is highly probable that he was. And you say, how do you know that? Because we know for a fact that the Apostle Paul was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Allow me to read you a statement from the book Education, page 64. Very short statement. Ellen White, in harmony with what we find in Acts 6 and 7, she's just commenting on Acts chapter 6 and 7, where Stephen is brought before the Jewish council and, of course, uh, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is there, so we have a biblical corroboration. She says, speaking of Saul of Tarsus, while still a young man, he became an honored member of the Sanhedrin. So if Saul of Tarsus was a member of the Sanhedrin, and one of the requirements to belong to the Jewish council was to be married, it is highly probable that the Apostle Paul was married at some time. We don't know what happened to his wife. Some women like to think that maybe they, she couldn't put up with him. And so she got divorced or separated from him. Now that's speculation. We don't know. But even if we agreed that the Apostle Paul wasn't married, which probably he was, most probably he was, the issue is not whether the Apostle Paul was married or not. The issue is whether we believe that Paul is merely giving his opinion or whether the Apostle Paul is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's where the issue really is. You say, if you say Paul wasn't married, therefore the opinion of Paul doesn't count for me. The question is, is Paul expressing his opinion, or do we believe that what we find in Scripture was inspired by God? The issue is the inspiration of the Bible. The issue is not the credibility of the Apostle Paul. Furthermore, you say, when are you going to get to the husband part? We will. <laughs> Furthermore, the Apostle Peter gives us the same counsel that Paul did. Notice 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's turn there, 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm going to read for now verse 1, and then I'm going to turn to verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 5. And by the way, did you know that the Apostle Peter was married? Any of you know that the first pope was married? By the way, I don't believe he was the first pope. But Peter, whom many Christians believe was the first pope, was actually not celibate. He was married. Because if you look at Matthew chapter 8 and verse 14, we're told that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Hello? So the apostle Peter was married. 
And what does Peter say about this issue? Notice 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word won by the conversation, that means by the conduct or the behavior of the wives. And then notice verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. So even if Paul was not married, Peter was. So what can Peter have to say about this? He can say a lot because he was married. Now a little bit later on we're going to talk more about what it means for the wife to be subject to the husband. But allow me to tell you a story and probably some of you have heard this story before. It's told in the little booklet Kindle Kindness by Adlai Esteb who was a great poet of the Seventh-day Adventist Church many decades ago. He tells this story about a woman who lived in the middle, in the Midwest of the United States. She was a very kind and loving Seventh-day Adventist Christian. But she had a very big problem. Her husband was a drunkard. And according to Esteb, this woman prayed day and night for her husband, that he would have a conversion experience, that he would stop drinking. Because when he drank, he would come home, he was verbally abusive, though he didn't abuse her physically, he was terribly abusive in terms of his speech. She never retaliated, never responded in a negative way to him, she only prayed. It just so happens that one night, this man was down at the bar drinking with his cronies, as he did almost every single night. And then he would come home and he would abuse his wife verbally. And you know, drunkards sometimes come up with the, most, with the strangest types of conversation imaginable. And after they were somewhat drunk, they started discussing an issue. And the issue was, which of them had the best wife? And one of the drunks would say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. My wife is the best wife. She's beautiful. She cooks great food. And the other ones would say, no, my wife is the greatest for such and such. And finally, this drunk says to all of them, none of you know what you're talking about. My wife is the greatest wife in the world. They said, how does that rate? He says, if you don't believe me, come and I'll show you. It was one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so here are these drunks, you know, they kind of, they come out of the bar and they're walking not too straight down the street. They finally come to the house, they go up the steps, in through the door. And this drunk hollers out, hey, and then he curses, says, get down here. And he heard the sweet voice, I'll be right down, dear. What would you have done, wives? Give him a piece of your mind? That's what we normally would do. Put on her robe, came down the stairs, and he says to her, these are my friends, and we're hungry, we want to eat. Now it's beyond one o'clock in the morning. She says, okay, dear, I'll go to the kitchen, I'll prepare something for you and your friends. Very kindly, very nice. You know, the friends were totally amazed that she didn't come down the stairs with a rolling pin <laughs> or with a baseball bat. And she was not verbally abusive. 
She went into the kitchen. Soon, the friends could hear the smell of food. She put the food on a tray, came through the door, and when she came through the door, the front door of the house was closing. All of the friends had left. And she was confused. She said to her, to her drunk husband, Dear, I thought your friends were hungry. Where are they? And he looked at her, now a little bit more sober, and says, Well, dear, uh, we didn't really come here because we were hungry. Oh, I thought you said that you, that you were all hungry. N no, that's not the real reason we came. Well, then why did you bring them? So he says, well, we had this discussion in the bar about how, who had the greatest wife. And I told them that I had the greatest wife in the whole world. And they wouldn't believe me, so I brought them home to prove it. And then he looked her in the eye and she, he said, dear, how can you be so kind and loving and nice to me when I am so mean with you? Now she saw her opportunity. Now her prayers were going to be answered. She looked him in the eye and she said, Dear, I'm preparing to go to heaven. And when I go to heaven, that'll be my home. There I will be fully happy. There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. You are planning to make only this earth your home. And I figure that being that this earth is going to be your home, that I need to make your life on this earth as happy as, as I can, because you're not going to where I'm going. Now, tears were streaming down his cheeks. And he looked her in the eye and he said, Dear, if you're going to heaven, I want to go to heaven with you. I want to be with you there forever. And you know, folks, from that moment on, he promised to the Lord that he would not take one more drink, and he kept his promise. In fact, he became a deacon in that church in the Midwestern United States. Now, why do I tell this story? Did this woman violate her conscience by going, going and making food? No. Did she violate her conscience by being kind and nice? No. She submitted to her husband. She prayed for her husband. She was kind to her husband. She loved her husband, even in the worst circumstances. And because of this, she was able to win her unbelieving husband. Did you notice what Peter had to say? Let's read it again. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Doesn't say only in the good times. That if any obey not the word, like in the case of this man, they also may be without the word, that is, without the Bible, be won by the conduct or the, by, by the conversation of their wives. That's exactly what happened with this man. She was subject to her husband, even in the trying times, and she manifested love and kindness and even obedience, as long as it was, it was not against her conscience. Now, what does the word submit really mean? The word submit, according to a Greek lexicon, by the way, it's the word hupotasso, means to obey, to be subject, or to be subordinate. That's what the word submit means, both in the writings of Paul and in the writings of Peter. In fact, allow me to mention several Bible verses where this word submit is used because the article that Jane gave me says that the word submit does not mean submit. For example, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 51, we find that we are told that Jesus lived in Nazareth and he was subject to his parents. Same identical Greek word. What does that mean, he was subject to his parents? It means that he was obedient to his parents. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, same word is used to describe children. Children should be in subjection to their parents. In other words, they should be obedient to their parents. They should reverence their parents, we might say. In Romans 13 and verse 1, the word submit, which Paul uses and which Peter uses, uh, is used to describe citizens being subject to the civil powers. Does that mean that we're supposed to obey the laws of the civil powers as long as they don't violate our conscience? Yes. This wife of the drunk, she didn't violate her conscience. She was subject to her husband. She even went to prepare the meal. You say, I would have given him a piece of my mind. But then he would have never been one to the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Listen, young people who are present here. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says that the youth should be subject to the elders of the church. Do you know why? Because the elders of the church have a lot of wisdom. They've lived a lot longer. They, they've seen the pitfalls and the problems that you might face in life. And so, youth, if you have struggles in your lives, look up one of the elders of the church or one of the pastors to provide wise counsel. But the word subject is used. The youth should be subject to the elders of the church. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, we are told that we should subject ourselves to God. That means that we're to be obedient to God. We're to do the will of God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 27, we are told that Jesus, when everything is finished on this earth, Jesus himself will subject himself to his Father. And of course, we studied this in our pre previous subject. I want to read one final text on this idea of subjection, and then I would like to answer the question, how far should we take this idea of subjection? Notice Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And I would like to read verse 18. Once again, this is the Apostle Paul. He says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Same word that we've been describing. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. I realize that this isn't popular. I realize that some people don't like me. My purpose is not to win a popularity contest. God has called me to preach the truth as it's found in the Word. Is that fair? You can like me personally and, and disagree with what I say as long as it's not in the Bible. Well, you can disagree with me even if it is in the Bible. But the Apostle Paul is very clear here. He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. And then notice this. This is very important. As it is fit in the Lord. Did you catch that? Wives are to submit to their husbands insofar they are what? Insofar what they require is what? In harmony with the Lord's will. In other words, husbands have no right to, to expect their wives to violate their conscience. In fact, if you go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, for a moment, Ephesians chapter 5, and I'd like to begin at verse 23, actually verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, notice, as unto the Lord. So what is the qualification? Is this blind and absolute submission of the wife to the husband? No, it isn't. It is a law as long as the husband is in the Lord. And what he asks is in harmony with the Lord's will. Now allow me 
to read you some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on this point. And I know the wives are going to enjoy these statements. Because the Bible says, wives, submit to your own husbands. But we're going to notice that the Apostle Paul also says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that husbands are to love their wives. Listen to this. This is in the Adventist homepage 117. The Lord Jesus has not been correctly represented in his relation to the church by many husbands in relation to their wives, for they do not keep the way of the Lord. I don't know whether you caught the seriousness of that statement, husbands. You see, the Apostle Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So if we don't love our wives the way God wants us to love our wives, that's a reflection on the image that people have of the relationship between Christ and His church. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I'm going to read that statement again. In other words, it's not only a reflection on us, it's a reflection on the Lord. On Christ and on the church. Once again, she says, The Lord Jesus has not been correctly represented in His relation to the church. See, Christ has not been represented correctly in His relation to the church by many husbands in their relation to their wives. By the way, to use an analogy, do you know that many of our young people and our children get their image of God from their fathers? That's one of the reasons why God has given us the privilege of parenthood. Do you know Ellen White says that when Enoch, and by the, by, by the way, this is corroborated in Scripture, it says that Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. Not that he didn't walk with the Lord before, but he walked with God in a special way because now he had a son. He understood the love of God for him. And so the relationship between husband and wife really it's an illustration of the relationship between Christ and His church. And if marriage goes wrong, the concept of the relationship between Christ and the church is blurred in the minds of people. She continues saying this, why haven't they represented Christ? They declare that their wives must be subject to them in everything. But, it was not the design of God that the husband should have control as head of the house when he himself does not submit to Christ. Wow. And you thought that Ellen White was this traditionalist who only had some things to say to wives. Now notice. He must, that is the husband, he must be under the rule of Christ that he may represent the relation of Christ to the church. Are you understanding what she's saying, folks? Husbands, are you understanding what she's saying? She's saying that the relationship between husband and wife leads people to understand the relationship that Jesus has with the church. And if our relationship with our wives is wrong, people are going to comprehend wrongly the relationship of Christ to the church. Now notice she continues saying, if he is coarse, rough, boisterous, egotistical, harsh, and overbearing man, let him never utter the word that the husband is the head of the wife and that she must submit to him in everything. Wow! She's saying that if the husband has these characteristics, and I'll read them again, coarse, rough, boisterous, egotistical, harsh, overbearing, she says, let him never utter the word that the husband is the head of the wife and that she must submit to him in everything, for he is not the Lord, he is not the husband in the true significance of the term. You know, I like us to think of this relationship between husband and wife not in terms of a master and a servant. There's a better model. The model of the king and the queen. 
That's a better model than the husband is the master and the wife is the servant. Get me a glass of water. Now. Yes, master. Bad model. Better a model of the husband is a king and the wife is a queen. By the way, do you know that the queen can make or break the king? Do you remember Queen Jezebel? Do you know what type of, what type of character? Do you know what type of character Ahab had? Do you know what would have happened if Ahab had had a good wife? He would have been a different man. You read Ahab's character in the Bible, it says he was like putty. Easily molded. And Jezebel gave him bad counsel and he followed the counsel and he became a wicked king. On the other hand, you have, for example, Pilate's wife. Remember the story of Pilate's wife? She has this dream. You know, husbands, wives are many times wise counselors. And we should listen to them. God gave them to us to be our other self. They can set us straight. They can tell us when we said something wrong, when we gave it the wrong emphasis, what we should have done. Don't get mad. If it's true, fix it. God has given us wives for that purpose. And I must admit that I don't even always practice when I preach. Pilate's wife has this dream. And in the dream, the Lord tells her, don't have tells her, tell Pilate not to have anything to do with this man. And she told him, she called him in, she said, Pilate, the Lord has given me this, this uh, dream, and in the dream, he has told me to give you some counsel, and that is have nothing to do with this man. And the Bible says that Pilate ignored the counsel of his wife. Wives can be instrumental in making or breaking their husbands. That's how important the role of the wife is. If the wife wasn't important, God would not have given us wives. Now notice this additional statement, speaking about the realm of sexual relations. Do you know that sex has been cheapened? And it's been cheapened in two mediums. It's been cheapened, first of all, by the media. Sexual relations, the emphasis is pleasure, hedonism. It's also been cheapened by the church. Is it by the church? And I'm going to have to say this, it's been cheapened by the Roman Catholic Church. Say, why is that? Because they've taught that original sin, the eating of the fruit by Eve from the tree, um, really was not eating a literal fruit from a tree, but really the fruit was sex. In other words, Adam had sexual relations with Adam and Eve before God gave him permission to, and that constitutes original sin. And so throughout the course of the centuries, the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church have been that sex is a necessary evil for procreation. That's the teaching. No, you, play, sex isn't for pleasure, even within marriage. It's, it's, it's only strictly for procreation. And that's, and they take it one step further, they make their priests celibate. Instead of, instead of doing what the Bible says. The Bible says that the apostles, the elders, the bishops, the deacons, all of the leaders of the church were married. They were to be the husbands of one wife. And so this idea that the church has projected that, that sex is evil, even within the context of marriage, has cheapened the, context, the concept of sex within marriage. And husbands, listen to what Ellen White has to say about the issue of sexual relations. 
This is in the book of Solemn Appeal, pages 173, 174. Some husbands expect their wives to be slaves in this area, to submit even against their conscience in certain things that take place within sexual relations inside marriage. Everything does not go in sexual relations even within marriage. Are you, am, am I being too explicit here? Notice what she says. No man can truly love his wife if she will patiently submit to become his slave and minister to his degraded passions. Do you understand that? She loses in her passive submission the value she once possessed in his eyes. See, when anything goes within the sexual relations in marriage, she says her passive submission leads to her losing the value she once possessed in his eyes. He sees her dragged down from everything elevating, elevating to a low level. And soon he suspects that she will perhaps as tamely submit to be degraded by another as by himself. He doubts her constancy and purity, tires of her, and seeks new objects which will arouse and intensify his hellish passions. The law of God is not regarded. These men are worse than brutes. See, now we're meddling with the men. And then she says this, they are demons in human form. They are unacquainted with the elevating, ennobling principles of true, of sanctified love. So being subject to the husband does not mean being subject in everything, even to the point of violating conscience. When it comes to conscience, the wife has a right to say no, because it is more necessary to obey God than man. And that applies even within the context of marriage. There's two things, besides many others, that I've appreciated about my wife. I appreciate that she's very beautiful, of course, and very loving. And one thing which, which I'll mention just in passing, I'll mention the other two in a, mo in a moment. I've appreciated the fact that she's not always sticking her nose in everything concerning the church. Because some wives become the pastors of the church. And I thank the Lord that she's there, she's supportive, you know, she, she encourages, she's in the background. And one thing she says, you know, I don't know how to play the piano, I don't know how to speak in public. But she says, there's one contribution that I am willing to make to the work. And that is, allow me to travel different places, preaching the word and being gone from home a lot. I can honestly say that not once in all the times that we've been married have I ever heard her nag or complain about me traveling different places. You're probably saying, well, she probably catches a break. <laughs> I don't think so. In fact, I know that that's not the case. She, she, she understands that her contribution to the work is me traveling and sharing the word wherever I go. You know, sometimes, however, there are times in which a decision needs to be made and the final decision needs to be made by the husband. Isn't that true? You know, for example, I remember when uh, we got the call to come to Fresno Central Church. It was about eight and a half years ago. Many of you know that my wife and I came and we interviewed here at the church. We had a very uh, 
vivacious interview with uh, many of the members of the church. I'm being kind. <laughs> and after, uh, you know, we had a call to Puerto Rico, at that, in fact, I had accepted a call to go to Puerto Rico already. And uh, we had a call to go to Georgia Cumberland Conference, and we were thinking about maybe going back to the seminary. We came, we interviewed, very, very uh, combative interview. And I remember my wife said, after the interview, she says, I'm not going there. <laughs> you can ask her if I'm telling her the truth. She's sitting right here. I can't, I can't say things you know, unless they're true because she's here. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a lie anyway. But you can check it with her. She said, I'm not going there. But I felt that the Lord was calling us here. And so, in spite of the fact that uh, she wasn't too inclined to come, I made the decision. And I believe if you ask her now, she'll tell you that she feels it was the right decision. Allow me to read you a statement from Testimonies, Volume 1, page 308. This is for the wives now. The requirements of the husband may sometimes seem unreasonable to the wife when if she should calmly, candidly take the second view of the matter in as favorable a light for him as possible, she would see that to yield her own way and submit to his judgment, even if it conflicted with her feelings, would save them both from unhappiness and would give them great victory over the temptations of Satan. The bottom line, folks, is that in marriage, marriage is a society, and there's room for the wife counseling the husband and the husband communicating with the wife. And then when a final decision needs to be reached, unless it's against conscience, the buck stops with the husband. I heard that amen, Eileen. <laughs> now, what is the responsibility of the husband? The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, husbands, what? Love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. So what is the responsibility? The, the responsibility of the wife is to submit to the husband. The responsibility of the husband is to what? To love his wife. Do you know what the word love is there in the Greek? Agape. Now I'm going to read the best, the best description in the Bible of agape, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Husbands, I'm going to ask you a question after I read what agape is, because it says, husbands, agape your wives. So let's read what agape is, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 13. Anybody ever heard of that chapter? Here the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to start reading at verse 4. And by the way, the King James says charity, but I'm going to translate it love because that's really agape. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. It's not self-centered, in other words. Is not puffed up. My way is the only way. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now the question. Wives, if your husbands were like, were like that, would you be willing to submit to them? 
Yes or no? Yes. Of course. If you would say, I wouldn't even have to think about it. But one of the reasons why wives do not submit to their husbands is because the husbands have become, oh, I have a word that it's on the tip of my tongue. I almost say it. The husbands have become jerks. In fact, one of the reasons for the feminist movement today is because husbands have, have um, abused their position as the head. And they have wanted to beat their wives into submission. And when that happens, there's going to be a natural reaction from the wives against it. And then, of course, all of society is thrown into disarray. Because as marriage goes, so goes society. And as society goes, so goes the world. And the devil knows it. Husbands, we cannot afford to be dictators. God did not mean when he said that we were the head that we're supposed to be dictators. And that wives are supposed to, uh, are supposed to fulfill every single one of our little petty desires. It doesn't hurt for husbands sometimes to, out of love for their wives, to, to, to take out the garbage. Now I'm talking about practical love here. Cooking a meal. You know what delights me? Sometimes I'll come home earlier than my wife and I'll, make a, I'll, I'll prepare a meal because I like to cook. It's kind of like a good release. And so when my wife comes home, she finds a meal prepared, you know, rice and beans, whatever it is. She says, wow, am I ever glad I don't have to cook today. Even if she said that the food was lousy and she said, I'm not ever glad I don't have to cook today, that makes my day. There's nothing wrong with husbands cleaning the bathrooms. That's not subservient. There's nothing wrong with husbands vacuuming the carpet. Husbands should not be dictators and their wives be dictated too because there's going to be rebellion. If we love the way the Apostle Paul says that we're supposed to love, wives would be very submissive. Now, I want you to notice something else about Ephesians 5. It says, husbands, love your wives. Agape your wives. But then it says that Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that Jesus showed his love because he what? He gave, he gave what? It says he gave himself. I like that. It doesn't say he gave a rose or an anniversary card or a dress, or a new car, or perfume, or money. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself. Love means what? Giving yourself. And when you, when you give yourself, your spouse has everything when he or she has you. One thing which, which really aggravates me today is prenuptial agreements. They're a recipe for failure. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign this prenuptial agreement. If things don't work out, I'll have a way out. Now, how, how much commitment is there in that situation? Or sometimes, you know, people give up too soon. You know, marriage is hard work. You don't believe that, do you? Those of you who are married, is marriage hard work? Yes, it is. Got to work on your marriage. But people give up too soon. You know, young people, we fall in love, and then we fall. <laughs> we fall in love, we get married real soon, 
And we enter marriage with the idea, well, you know, I'm getting married. I know the Bible says, uh, you know, well, the Bible doesn't actually say it, but I know that I'm supposed to get married till death do us part. It doesn't have that ex specific expression, though in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says that marriage can be dissolved only through death. And Jesus amplifies it through adultery. But we go into marriage thinking, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, we always have divorce as an option. When I got married, divorce wasn't an option. You were going to work on your marriage. You were going to consecrate your life to the Lord. And, and you were going to stay together for life. And you had to get along, and you had to love each other and come together, because basically you were going to be with your wife the rest of your life. And that's the way we need to enter marriage. That means giving ourselves. Everything we are, everything we have, everything we do. You know what agape is? It's very simple. And I'll give you my definition of agape. It means giving without expecting anything in return. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Isn't it true sometimes, husbands, that we give because we want to get? I'll give my wife this nice little present because then maybe we'll have some good sexual relations later on. That's not love. True love does not have mercenary motives. It is not utilitarian. It does not take advantage. Love is giving, expecting nothing in return. If we got only bad things in return, we would still give. That's what agape is. Now let me ask you this. If all of the husbands that are here this morning would say, you know what? From now on, I'm not going to worry at all about anything that I get from my wife. My only objective in life is going to be to give her everything that she enjoys, everything that she likes. I'm just going to give. Nothing for me, not worry about my own thing. I'm going to give her and give and give. Expecting nothing in return. If she doesn't respond to me, fine, I'm still going to give. And if the wife said the same thing, she said, you know, I, I know that marriage isn't about myself. I'm going to give and give and give, expecting nothing in return from my husband. What kind of marriage do you suppose that would be? That would be the perfect marriage. Do you know why? Because if the husband, his only objective is to totally give to his wife, and the wife totally give to her husband, both of their needs would be fully supplied. But the trouble is, we go into marriage with the idea of getting for me. And we hold back, and we reserve for ourselves. And love means giving without reservations. And by the way, notice Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Remember that statement, give and it shall... Excuse me, give and it shall... Be given unto you. Now notice, let's read that. Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. So if we give all, what happens? It comes back. But it comes back much more abundant. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together. In other words, the idea is that you have the measure and you press it down and more fits in there. You press that down and more fits in and you shake the, the, the receptacle and so you can get more in. That's the idea. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. And this applies to marriage as well. For with the same measure that ye meet out, it shall be measured to you again. What we give and invest in our marriage is what we get back. If we love without reservations, if we give without reservations, that will come abundantly back to us, more than we ever dream or more than we ever desire. 
By the way, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 29 that the husband is to nourish his wife. Really, a better translation would be the husband is to nurture his wife. It literally means to bring something to full maturity. The husband has a role in playing in bringing the wife to the full, full maturity, to full nurture. That means that the husband is to encourage the wife to grow spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally. He is to be a strong support to nurture his wife. He also says that we're supposed to cherish our wives. The word cherish means simply to foster. It's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7 where the Apostle Paul speaks about uh, a nurse cherishing children. In other words, it really means a nurse taking care of children, caring for children. I guess we could say that it's very good for husbands to baby their wives. Are we doing that, husbands, babying our wives? There's someone in our congregation, I won't, I won't mention his name because I didn't get permission, but I've always admired him because everything is wife-centered, other than being God-centered, of course. But in his marriage, there's nothing he won't do for his wife always trying to please her, always giving to her. I wish I could mention his name, I won't. But I've always admired that, because that's what agape is all about. That's what giving yourself is all about. One problem in marriage, the biggest problem, is that we're more takers than givers. Now I'm going to read a list of words, and I want you to tell me the antonym, or the opposite. Rich? Oh, come on. It's not quite lunchtime yet. Rich? That's a little better. Good? Right? Beautiful? Black? Love? I knew you were going to say that. The opposite of love is self. Think about it. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is self. Because love means loving God and others. It means focusing on others. An absence of love means what? Focusing on ourselves. And as we study next Sabbath, next Sabbath I'm going to speak to you about the five pitfalls of marriage. And we're going to discover that the fu fundamental problem in marriage that needs to be resolved is self. Amen. That's the root cause of all marital problems, self. Because I want to get my way. I want to do it my way. And that's why the only way we can have happy marriages is if we have a converted heart. Conversion is the solution to all of our marital problems. Now, I'd like to conclude this morning by going to Ephesians chapter 5 once again. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 33, I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul says here. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular. See, now I'm not saying Fresno Central, husbands, we need to love our wives. I'm not speaking in general terms. I, like the Apostle Paul, he says, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. What are we supposed to do? Love our wives as ourselves. And then notice the responsibility of the wife. It says, and the wife see that she what? See that she reverence her husband. Wives, 
I have seen in the course of the many years that I've been a pastor, I've seen wives sometimes belittle, humiliate, and berate their husbands in front of other people. Not acceptable. In fact, the word reverence that is used here is the very word that is translated in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, fear God and give glory to Him. In other words, you could translate this that wives are to fear their husbands. Oh, fear? Afraid? No. When the Bible tells us that we're supposed to fear God, it means we're supposed to respect Him. We're supposed to hold Him in awe. And that's the way wives should look upon their husbands as their husbands love them. Now let me ask you, is, if there is love, is it easier for the wife to submit in the light of what we've talked about today? See, this is the balance of the sermon that I preached before. See, if, if husbands love their wives, Wives know that the husbands have their best in mind. And there will be no problem submitting to the wise counsel of a consecrated man. 